All right. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> I think you all know who I am, um, but I'm John, and uh, thank you all for coming and welcome to the first of our summer speaker series that we're starting in August. So it's sort of the late summer speaker series. And uh, before continuing, I want to mention a few little housekeeping details. Uh, first of all, you, you purists here at the Meeting House may notice that the pulpit has been moved back. And we've done that to make it a more friendly environment for a talk such as this. But it's held by four screws, and we'll move it back when we're done. Um, and the other thing is, of course, this is a free Meeting House, and this is, of course, a free event. And we very much believe in that. However, if you're feeling of an Ely Masonary <laughs> sort of feeling is coursing through your veins, feel free to make a donation in the little box on your way out. So, um, now the other thing is, <laughs> you can look it up. Um, uh, I have my little cheat sheet here. I just want to remind you all that we, this, uh, this is the first of our series, and we have Amber Lanky coming uh, in two weeks followed by Alby Barden, also on a Thursday night, two weeks after Amber. Then Chip Johnson, who will be talking on marijuana in Maine. I know that's going to be a real uh, crowd pleaser. And uh, <laughs> Amy, Amy Robottom is coming to talk about her cheese making uh, efforts uh, as the final speaker in September 12th. And then this late breaking news, we're going to close out our uh, events calendar with a musical night with Greg Boardman, Elsie Gawler and uh, Steve Muse, who are tremendous uh, traditional uh, fiddle uh, players and singers. And they're coming on the 17th, which is a Tuesday, unlike our Thursday events. And uh, so we're not going to put these posters up for a while because it's too far away, but uh, I hope you'll all keep that in mind. All right. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Barry Dana. Uh, our first speaker, and uh, I have known Barry since I first beat him in a canoe race in 1986, and he's beat me ever since, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we've known each other a long time. He is a, a man of many accomplishments. He's not only a tremendous paddler and a holder of many national titles for canoe racing, whitewater canoe racing. He is a tremendous artist. He's a painter. He is a basket maker, and they're like baskets that you have never seen before. Uh, they're uh, remarkable, they're unique, they're very original. They're made out of uh, birch bark with his uh, etchings uh, covering the bark. It's really fantastic. He is an educator. He goes to schools. He, he teaches groups uh, throughout the state of Maine uh, on uh, native culture and uh, other subjects that uh, I'm sure he'd be glad to discuss. He is a tremendous athlete. He's a long distance runner. He runs many, many miles. He's also a trail hiker of some repute. He has uh, covered many miles of the Appalachian Trail uh, at very high speeds. Uh, <laughs> he is a gardener. He is a, I would call him a food philosopher. He thinks a lot about what he eats. He talks about it and uh, he's very thoughtful uh, on those issues. He is a father of five wonderful children. He is a husband of a wonderful wife, Lori, who's here today. And thanks for coming. Uh, he is uh, the former chief of the Penobscot Indian Nation. And uh, he is um, obviously a native Penobscot. He is a, a fierce uh, advocate for uh, Native American cultural uh, issues and political issues. Uh, he's an activist, an advocate, and uh, he's also damn interesting to talk to and listen to, and that's why you're all here. Because uh, he'd like, he's asked me to call this a discussion as opposed to a lecture, and I think he's anxious to engage all of you in a, in a give and take. Uh, a little known secret is, uh, or I guess, perhaps it is, is known, but Barry actually uh, spends a lot of time in Solon. He keeps his dogs here. Uh, he keeps, uh, well, he sort of lives here in a way. <laughs> but, but we don't really talk about that that much. In fact, he lives just over the hill. Uh, so for all these reasons, 
Uh, uh, we're glad to have you here, and please welcome Barry Dave. Well, I'll start off just by kind of rambling since I never prepare a speech. Um, some of you may have heard that before. I've tried to prepare speeches and they, they look really good on paper. And then I get up in front of the crowd and I look at the paper and there's no words on it. <laughs> they literally disappear. So I, I started uh, coming up with this idea that, well, if you're in any particular audience, it's really that audience that you're engaged with. No one else. So it's, is there possibly this give and take that I'm experiencing and you're experiencing that we're not even aware of? So I like, to, I like to do it like this. Well, what's on your mind? Because I'm here to address your, your thoughts, your questions, and maybe some of your preconceived notions. I, I struggle with English. So I really admire John's ability to, to speak. Um, preconceived notions, is that all right? I'll always look at someone and say, is that the right <laughs> thing? <laughs> you think you know something about Native people. And, and this goes for Native people. I've corrected a lot of even my own upbringing. You, you get caught into thinking you know something because somebody said it. Somebody wrote it down. And in fact, it may not be true. And until you come to a realization, a revelation, you're stuck in a way of thinking that, well, we'll leave, just leave you there. My entire life has been pushing um, those understandings. Is, is that really true? And if it is, great. If it's not, let's be honest about it. So through my upbringing, which has been on the reservation, so, you know, my first 19 years, when you're really taking in the world, was, other than teachers at a high school, were Native people. My thinking, the way I approach issues, the way I talk, and the way I spell, <laughs> is really from a Native perspective. I cannot spell your English language to save my life because all the vowels are screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, God damn, underline, <laughs> right underline. I just want to kill the computer. I said, Laura, how do you spell this? And she'll say, well, say it for me. And I'll say it. She goes, you're not even saying it. Mm -hmm. I think still in Penobscot. I'm not fluent in the Penobscot language, but I listened to native people who were speak English and they did it with the Penobscot linguistical sound. So that's just an example of where my mind is when I, when I take on issues, whether it's food, climate, uh, whatever. I, I give to you my perspective coming from a native background. Sometimes it's unique, sometimes it's, it's right on, and sometimes it's maybe a little far-fetched because I've had to fill in the gaps. You take a, a, a race of people who have literally suffered through a genocide over 400 years, it becomes very difficult to get caught up in the mainstream you know, of your world. So there are things in mainstream society that Native people have still not you know, taken hold of. Because it's foreign, it's still foreign, we still think Native. Um, you know, we have our Native uh, ways that we do not want to let go and we need we want them respected we want them to be held in a place of recognition as native I get into conversation with some people say you know we need to be one people and I say no we don't we need to be people sure and respect one another but we can be of a different race and respect the differences because those, those differences make us unique. Well, we're all one rainbow. I said, yeah, but in that rainbow, there are three primary colors, aren't there? <laughs> so we can be unique, we can be of our own race, and yet have relationships with all peoples that need to be in a way that respects one another. Teach simplicity. 
in terms of how people should live in balance with your surroundings, in balance with nature, in balance with one another, in balance with yourself. It's, it's, it's the key towards a healthy life. <coughs> so, you know, I spent a lot of time traveling to native communities. You know, you may take your kid and put them on a plane off to some foreign country where they can learn a different culture. My mother did the same thing, but it was in a car and we drove to Oklahoma and it was a native reservation. It was in a, well, it was really a van that kind of rattled all the way to Oklahoma. And it was, or a car that went to Canada to the modern reservations. So my upbringing was, those were my world travels, was going to other native people and having the native concepts and thinking reinforced by elders, many of whom didn't even, didn't even speak English. So that's embedded in me. And I try to bring, use that as a model for discussions as to where we go from here as, as, a, as a worldwide community. So there are many issues that fall under the umbrella of how do we address something in native country. Okay, so I'm, I'm Wabanaki or from the Penobscot Nation. So that's, let's get to the core. And, and I'm part of the world, uh, you know, the race we call Indian because of uh, the Spanish people who used the word Indios, meaning people of God. Had nothing to do with India. Sorry to, sorry to break that news to you. <laughs> but at least that's recent um, thinking from uh, historians who have gone through all the records and said, hey, this wasn't about India. This was about Indios, people of God. So I really uh, appreciate John asking me to come down. I, and I'm really glad you all turned out. And I hope that uh, through your questions and comments, we can make tonight um, an evening where better understanding is the goal. Okay, so we'll start with the guy in the hat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the first question that there's no answer to is how the heck do you find time to do all the stuff you do? <laughs> <laughs> and then the second question is I'm interested in the historical relationship between the tribes of the Northeast we, I guess we've been told that the Iroquois nation was kind of like Rome. They were very organized and militaristic. And they sort of shoved all the other tribes in different directions. Is that true? And how did the Wabanakis end up in Maine? Was it by choice or did they enjoy living in Maine? The <laughs> yoke. <laughs> 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 and and my, before I forget, you're living on stolen land. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm not a historian. Uh, my cousin is a historian, and every time he rattles off a, a fact, I, I say, yeah, "Are you sure about that?" Because who 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 wrote down the history? You know, it wasn't native people who wrote it down. It was it, it was uh, Europeans who wrote it down. And, more, and even Father Rawl, who lived with the Abenaki for 30 years, wrote it in such a way that he wanted people back in France to be thinking something. He didn't write it, in my view, based on the best interests of the native people. He may have got a lot of facts correct, but there were some things in there that uh, I remember um, that, that didn't hold water. But I apologize for not being a historian, so I can't give you exact dates, times, but I can give you the essence of how, how we think in terms of what may have happened, in my view. We have a treaty with the Mohawk, and that was a good idea. <laughs> you don't want to piss them off, right? Like you said, they were well-formed. Uh, they had six nations in a confederacy, and we have five. You know, I say five because the, the European concept of native people is these separate tribes. When in fact, we weren't separate tribes, we were all the same people with different locations we lived in. So if you're Banawebske, you live on that river with those rocks because you're a great paddler. And if you're Sibayegewe, you're those people who live along the edge of the coast because you're a great fisherman. 
So we get these names based on where we live. But the, the Mohawk or the Haudenosaunee people, they were, they were sort of of their own as we were too. I mean, that's just common sense, right? You're, you all live in a particular area. But how did we get there? I like that part. You all heard that we came across the Bering Strait, and yet there's no proof of it. Yet we have proof. And I, when I say indigenous proof, it doesn't mean you're going to find this in a book. Indigenous proof is what we know from our genetic uh, consciousness. And that my thinking is we came from South America, and we migrated north. And then, and then as the glacier retreated, we went with it. I think there's a time period we had to give for the land to rebound and all that to take care of itself, but we did not come from Asia. We came from South America, and if you look at our foods that we brought or somehow obtained, it came from South. It all came from the South. So I don't. So here's the historical part: Why, if we all sort of kind of came like this and went like that? then how did they become Haudenosaunee, we became Wabanaki. You know, and, and we're talking how many thousands of years? I don't know. Wouldn't it be cool to think that we, it was all one people and that as you spent all that time in that one spot, your language sort of adapted to itself and it became different than a neighboring people. Now here's one interesting thing before I forget. We had people living here 700 years ago that migrated around the Haudenosaunee and went into the Great Lakes area. And you've heard of the, uh, the Cree, the Chippewa, and the Ojibwe. Yeah. Those are the same people as us. And they still live out of bounds from that language. Yeah. yeah. My great, I went to, I went to uh, Mi'kmaq country for this big native gathering, and there was a fellow there who spoke Ojibwe. And he was talking in Ojibwe. And my grandmother was smiling and nodding her head and I'm going, uh, how, many, how many miles apart is this? You know, Minnesota and Maine? Actually, he was in Canada. He was, he was from up in Canada. Yep, she understood every word he said. I said, how did you know what he said? I don't know, he just said it and I knew what he said. So that was the first clue that I had that the, uh, the Anishinaabe people, which is even in our language, is the same, same word for a native person. So it's pretty interesting, all that moving around. I wish I knew the whole picture, but uh, I can tell you that Wabanaki have been here for, a, you know, they say 12,000 years or more. Whatever that time period where the glaciers receded. Uh, other than that, we were Delaware, maybe New Jersey Shore, waiting, you know, living there. Good. And how do I find time to do all this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, and I'll introduce my wife, uh, Laurie, and I made, a, made a, uh, an agreement quite a while ago that we weren't going to be held to jobs if we had vision, you know, you know, passion to do something different. We'll make it work. So we did. And uh, so we, we, we feed ourselves with the garden, even though we still buy a lot of things. But, um, you know, and I work, and she works, but it's in, in between. We make it. We just make it sound like a lot. <laughs> yes. Who's that? Who's next? Is that it? Am I done? Thank you. Peter. Yes. Um, well, first of all, I would love to see some of your baskets. So I hope they're going to come out of that big basket. But that's not really my question. My question has more to do with how you keep balance in these days that so many of us find so stressful and distressing when we see what's happening to our environment, what's happening to civility, etc. I'm just going to ask you for a little bit of wisdom if you could share it with us. I think my balance comes from my age. You know, I, I feel fortunate to have grown up on, within a Native community. At a, at, at a time where maybe my generation was the last generation to really be immersed in, in a native upbringing. Um, when the sun came up, I was out of the house and I didn't come home until sundown. And my mother didn't worry about me. That's the way it was in reservation life. Us kids were like, you know, a pack of dogs. You know, we would go over and play and, and we borrowed 
old motorboats and use two by fours for paddles and go around the island. And you know, we just spent all day out. But I also spent a lot of time with native elders, watching them make baskets, picking uh, plants, um, carving things, and listening to the stories. And you know, one really important elder was my grandma. And uh, she, she was kind of like a professional sweetgrass braider. She would braid sweetgrass for the basket makers. So she would trade the sweetgrass 100 yards. And my uncle, who's a mathematician, said, how do you know it's 100 yards? You know, she says, because I told you so. <laughs> so he unrolled one, and he measured it with a yardstick, and it was 100 yards. <laughs> and the way she would measure it was from her nose to an outstretch. <laughs> yeah. So I would sit with her, and I think that is when I kind of like go inside and to find that balance, like, okay, you know. And with that is nature. Uh, who can't go into nature and not unwind, right? Everybody can, because, and it's not just like, because it's, because it's nature, or, you know, we think it's supposed to do it for us, so it does. There's literally, you know, science that says you're gonna calm down in nature because of what the interactions in nature, the things in nature that chemically react with the body. So it's, it's, it only makes sense. Plus I go barefoot. If you wanna relax, if you wanna find balance, go barefoot, it's instant. You know, and, and if you need to walk on something that's really balancing is water. Uh, you know, like the beach and walking, you know, through water. It's just, it, you can't find anything more healing. Where I struggle, and you may not, is this conflict between two cultures. So if I'm being raised to, to honor the earth, if I'm being raised to preserve tradition so that people's health and my health and the health of the earth is a priority, I was raised with that. I wasn't given all, you know, like a blueprint. And then to witness the way we live today, which is 180 of that, in the sense of things that we do to change the climate, it's frustrating. I get very, very upset. And somewhere in that effort to say, well, why don't we kind of bring it back? You know, why don't we calm down what we're doing? Um, there's, there's a need to say it. And some people don't like it. They get mad. Um, so I get frustrated. But then you wake up the next morning and that, that responsibility is still there. It doesn't go away. So if you hold a responsibility, let's say as a parent, you're not gonna get up the next morning and say, I don't feel like being a parent today. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, you can't let down on it. You can't turn your back on it. So I get frustrated, and I get frustrated with Native people just as well as anybody. Uh, we have Native people flying all over the globe because they're important people. la dee freaking da You know, and I let them know, and they don't like it. We have this great healing ceremony. It's a nice ceremony, and it's very meaningful, and it does a lot for Native, for, for people in general. But they fly in people from New Zealand, from other parts of the world, and I'm going, Wait a minute, this is for healing the earth, but you're flying people in. Um, somebody help me with this thought, because I'm thinking it's hypocritical. And I don't want to call people hypocrites. So how do, I how do I find this balance to be able to con converse these ancient traditions in modern times? We, a lot of people like to talk. Oh, us native people, you know, we love the earth, blah, blah, blah. And, and in fact, look at, look at their words and then, then their lifestyle. Do they match? Oftentimes they don't. So that's part of my responsibility, is, is, is getting native traditions in, back into modern day living. Not just because it's cool, but no, that, that, that freaking corn is really important. It's not just corn, it's, it's very important to me, my health. So if I'm eating corn, I'm not eating, I'm gonna get them all mad on this one here. 
If I'm eating corn, I'm not eating wheat. I think wheat is a killer of, of society. Now, I know recently there's better wheat, and that's probably safe, so that's good. But how many people are eating that? You got all of Indian country. They're not eating that wheat. They're eating bagels. They're eating white bread. They're eating wheat bread. They're eating pancakes. They're eating cupcakes and cakes and ice cream and all this junk. And I'm going, stop. <laughs> you know, because it almost stopped me. But I had a, so I had a wake up call. And uh, I took it serious, real serious. I coined the phrase in my brain 100%. Now you, oh, moderation. <laughs> if, you could, if, if moderation works for you, beautiful. Not for me. For me, it was 100%. If I'm going to suffer a heart attack when I shouldn't have, then I'm going to go the opposite direction. I'm going to go 100% to prevent that from ever happening again. And what I found was traditional native food was my answer. So that, you know, that's why I'm not going to do the wheat. My DNA doesn't recognize it. Uh, I'll do corn, squash, and beans, and traditional native food. So that's my balance, but it doesn't mean I'm always balanced. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of like this. Yeah, and uh, Laura's a good-natured boy, but uh, she puts up with a lot. Yes? This is a totally different question, and I'm more perhaps mundane, but I um, saw the beautiful structure that you have erected at the Colby Art Museum, and I was surprised that it was called that this thing called a wigwam because I always thought a wigwam was something that was animal skin wrapped around something that was sort of a like teepee. But is a wigwam a, a Wabanaki word? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Okay. So okay. if I I have to tell little kids about your structure at some point because I'm a docent. So I thought, am I, is it okay to say this is a wigwam? You know, and, yes. and that's a Wabanaki word for house or for what? Um, Their house. Their house. Nigwong, Gigwong, Wigwong. Nig Nigwong, my house. Nigwong would be your own house. My house. Wig Wigwong. Gig Gigwong would be your house. Wigwong would be their house. Uh, so if we're going to make this structure, no one's going to live in it. It's not mine, it's, yours, it's or anybody's. It's just no this. No one's going to live in it, right? Yeah. 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 So maybe we should call it Igwong, so that nobody owns it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's helpful. Somehow come in from somewhere else, and it wasn't really uh, true to the local. Uh, no, it is. Yeah, wigwam. Okay. So that, um, and and then of course, you know, if you were a teacher in Penobscot language, you you, you would use wigwam as your centerpiece, yeah. and then all these things surrounding it. He's gathering the materials to build the wigwam. Uh -huh. You know, uh, or or maybe in that sense, it would be gigwam. You know, his his house. Yeah. So really well, let me tell you how I came. Really there, so. Yeah, let me tell you how I came about that structure. Laurie and I, with a friend, were hired by the Abbey Museum to build a Wabanaki wigwam. Down we went, got the materials. They gave us the blueprint. Archaeologists discovered everything. Here's the blueprint. Build it out of the traditional material, and we did. wrapped in bark, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. So we got the poles, we set it up, we were sewing the panels of bark on, and the Abbey um, staff had brought through a, a, uh, a tour, okay? So the tour guide had all these people come through, and we have a project going on, and the, these folks are building a traditional Wabanaki wigwam. And at that instant, it was like lightning struck my brain and it blew it apart. I went, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, so here it is. It was seven feet tall, teepee shaped, yeah. a diameter of maybe eight feet, with a fire pit, a diameter of seven feet. <laughs> and, you know, for some crazy reason, I wasn't thinking about it before that minute, that moment. Uh, you know, yeah, we'll build a wigwam, we're gonna get our money and go home. Yeah. Spend three days camping out on yeah. MDI, it'd be great. So that's how I come to my 
you know, my perspective on Native culture and traditions is by experiencing them as best I can. So that was a unique opportunity. Can I ask you if so you can figure you out what it was? What did you do about that? Well, we finished making it and so took our seven money and went home. Yeah. Ah, it wasn't a wigwam. Okay. All right. So, so but it was eight foot are, diameter, seven foot fire pit, seven feet high, made out of bark, shaped like this. Are the structures on Shooter Island more authentic? Yeah, but I want to get you back to this thing. Okay. What, what yeah. was this? A smokehouse. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. It usually takes twenty-five minutes to get people to that answer. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So it was like what else? No, a smoke, no a smokehouse. Smokehouse. Yeah, for the fish. Yeah. For the fish. Yeah. Figure, you know, you're on MDI, what are you going to be eating? You're going to be smoking everything that comes out of the water. But where did these, these people, where did these people just figure this out from? Where did they found that, those... Archaeological digs. They found, they, they they found they post holes. Misinterpreted. They, they, they found that they were, they were on the coast. There were right. digs on the coast. Yeah. I see. So where did the design for the one that you just built come from? <laughs> Okay. What makes sense? So let's go to Sugar Island. I was hired to make two wigwams on Sugar Island. All right, traditional. Yeah, I got it. All right, I know it's not a teepee because I'm smart. I figured that one out already. So what did we make? And I say we, my friend was uh, John Nepton, he worked with me. We made a dome, 15 feet in diameter. This is almost an impossibility. And we didn't find out until we were up about here. Mm -hmm. And we both just looked at each other and said, this is foolish. Yeah. Okay, 15 feet in diameter for a, a dome around, yeah. that's not a whole lot of living space. Yeah. But that's, I, I guarantee you, that's as big as you can go with traditional building materials. Yeah. So we, we really pushed it on this dome. Laurie and I made a dome for the Hudson Museum. Was it eight feet in diameter? six feet high, just a little thing. It's, it's meant to be small as a, as a uh, demo, mm -hmm. yeah. all right? But, but even at that point, I hadn't figured it out yet. John Neptune and I figured out by doing it, a 15 foot diameter dome is big, but by the time you get up to here, it makes no sense how you're gonna cover it with bar. We were frustrated. So we, we did what we could, you know, common sense wise to get it done. Well, they wanted two wigwams, and God, that, that first one used up almost all the material. So uh, I managed to scrounge up some old bark that we had in the garage, and we made a miniature longhouse, like what's at Colby. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit bigger. Yeah. Uh, but a smaller one, and it just went like that. It was no problem. We had no problems making it. The design of the, of the longhouse, you know, arched poles, but long, not round, long, with flat walls, or you could, you could round off the walls too. Um, it just made so much more sense. So when Colby contacted me and said, can you do this? I said, please, <laughs> I want to try it again. <laughs> you know, I need this experience to, to learn more. Mm -hmm. And um, So you, the, your design is what makes sense to you yeah. in terms of the materials and what it was used for and you know, the utility of it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So that what Colby has, I would say, is a is a nice two person wiggle, mm -hmm. twelve by sixteen. Mm -hmm. Start have, start having kids, you know, and that, that wiggle is going to get longer. What are the materials in there? I got ash saplings from John's backyard. Hey, <laughs> John. <laughs> yeah. So all the saplings are bent. I mean, uh, bent saplings are white ash, and it's strong. Oh yeah. goodness, strong. And, and it'll last for a long time. Yeah. So did you set it up in a rack to them? I did. Yeah. For how long? Hard. How long did it take? Four days. That's all. Yeah, I would like to stay in the rack longer. So what I did was I I, I bent two saplings together. Yeah. I got the shape that I liked. I laid them on the ground, and then I, I put up a, a bracket of poles you know, this high, yeah. and then bent all the other ones to the same shape, and then I put them on the truck and drove them to Colby all bent already. What was the bark covered in? White birch. White birch. Yep. Is that the traditional covering? It's not animal skins. What happens when animal skins get wet? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that they could shed their oh, yeah. 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 stink. Yeah, yeah. Right? So we use birch bark for okay. canoes and wigwams, baskets, uh, just a host of things. Animal skins would be used for clothing. Because mm. you, you, if you get it soft and you smoke it, that, that is its waterproof. Mm. But you, you really couldn't. And, 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 and the skins would be for flooring and bedding. Mm -hmm. uh, just about any bark you can get off a tree in a sheet would be used for wigwam. Mm -hmm. So birch is easy, but um, spruce mm -hmm. and elm mm -hmm. and poplar. Those are the only ones that I know. If there's others, great. If, uh, those are the ones I do know that we wow. did use. Because at one time we had elm trees all over. Did you have to steam your ash? No, you don't have to because you get it in season. So I was out there, what, three weeks ago, mm. and get them home, I put, one, put them on a ladder on top of the truck so I could get them home without them bouncing all over the place. <laughs> and then um, bend them between a tree like this, mm. so that you get every, every inch of that sapling bent, pre-bent, and then I take the bark off, and then put it in the bracket, let it dry like that. Yeah, so you don't have to steam it. How do you get the, uh, how do you get all the bark to stick to one unit? I got a stick that's three feet high. I put it on a tree. I use it as a, a guide. And I take the bark off in that three foot sheet around the tree. But then the sheets, now do they, do they use sap or something so that they stick to each other? Otherwise, you got leaves that it's going to, you got the bark that it's well, here's where some of my, my learning still needs to happen. I can't picture bark being sewn together and have a waterproof because you're making holes to sew. Yeah. So what I haven't figured out yet is, is the perfect sap, fat mix that's going to work because if it gets a day like today, it's going to run off. If it's too cold and you bump it, it's going to crack off. So um, I'm still kind of playing that on my head. I wonder if we had another a, a mixture of, of uh, pitch, maybe pine, spruce. And I just recently learned about birch being boiled, the bark, the bark itself boiled down and makes, like, makes like an epoxy. That would be waterproof and I bet that would hold up and then mix it with, with animal fat. But I kind of wonder if you kind of like slap it on a thin piece of bark and slap it over all your root laces. Because that's what we do on the bow end of a canoe. Why wouldn't we have done that with a wigwam? I just haven't tried it yet. Yeah, so the bow ends of the canoe, you would have thin strips of bark put in really hot sap mixed with animal fat and just shape it right to the bow of your boat and it's, it sticks nice. Yes? Picture of what? The uh, wigwam? Yeah. I have no idea if it's there or not. Can I show it to you? I, there was one at Sertamont Springs we made. This is... It's not a great picture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was about like... this big. I, it was a dome, right? Yeah. Yeah, that one we made at sort of what springs. Um, oh, okay. I don't know, about 2011? That's it. Yeah. Well, what happens really the yes. one that you made for Kobe after the exhibit is over in January? I don't know. <laughs> can you move it? I mean, it's pretty big, but maybe you can, it can be moved. It can be taken apart. You can apart and reassemble us, but. It could be, yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's really lovely. I mean, it's a shame that you lose it. I'm going to have this guy who wrote a book, and he copied down what Father Raw wrote. I'm going to ask him to come to the Colby when it's time to move it and put it in his canoe and move it. Huh? Yeah, because that's what Father Raw wrote. Yeah. They would pack up their wigwams and put them in the canoes and go down to the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So, like, you would pack up your house, put it in right. your caravan, and go down to the ocean. Try it. <laughs> he actually, he actually, the, the author of this book came to the Hudson Museum when Mari and I and my daughter were making a very small, very small wigwam, you know, 
eight feet by whatever. And uh, I said, hey, Carrie, why don't you roll this up and put it in the canoe and use it? <laughs> he said, but Father Raw wrote it. I said, why did you regurgitate it? Yeah. You know, there is this thing called common sense. Right. Think about stuff. Anyway, I, I tease him because he, he, he wrote this book called Notes on a Lost Flute. Notes on a Lost Flute. Yeah, it's, it's a very this nice book. He, he did a beautiful job yeah. with plants yeah. in it and other things. But, you know, if you're going to regurgitate what Father Raw wrote, <laughs> think about it first. So the old story was that you moved where you needed to be, or in the summer you went to the coast and and then you came inland in the winter time. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. There's no bugs on the coast, but there's more wind. There's no bugs on the coast? Well, <laughs> there's only there's, 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 there's seafood. They are killers on the coast. Yeah. I've never been bitten so fast by a mosquito. They don't hover, they go. So this is another false story. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and one that I grew up with thinking that, yep, we packed everything up and went to the coast in the summer. Father Roll wrote it, other people regurgitated it. So we were in the garden one day here in Solon, and I said, wait a minute, who in the hell would grow a garden and then leave it for the summer? Yeah. Someone who wanted to feed animals and not themselves, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that was my first time that that little light went on in terms of that. So, all right, let's think about it. You were in Norwich Walk and you decide, geez, I'm hungry for clams. <laughs> Let's go get some clams. All right, John, how long would it take you and I to paddle Nor uh, from Norwich Walk to the coast? Yeah, be a couple days, probably. You think so? How long did it take to do the clam? Yeah, maybe a day. Yeah, you could do it in a day. Especially if you know the tide going out, That you know, because the tide came where? All the way to Waterloo? All the way to the water. At least. Yeah. Maybe Scow Egan. Yeah. All right, no, so. No, it came to it. Augusta. I don't think it went that much higher. Boy, you, you don't know, do you? No, we don't. We don't know. Because um, on the Penobscot, we have in our mounds on the reservation um, uh, sturgeon bones. Yeah. Right? So, you know, they come out of the ocean going up the river. Yeah. And I think they kind of They're want to stay. They're going water on that, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think they like that salt. Influence. Yeah. So anyway, you catch you catch the tide going out. You're you're on the coast, and literally the same day. But if you did want to take an overnight, all right, and you really can't take your wigwam apart. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what time of year is this we're talking about? If you're canoeing. Spring. Spring. Cold water. Okay. And what what would you do for camping in the spring if you went camping? You can't take your house, but you would take a tent. tent. Okay. So if you're in a canoe, you have no better tent than a canoe. You just turn it over and you're under it. It's waterproof. And if, and if it is buggy, you have a little smudge going and you sleep good. So you don't think that these trips to the coast happened at all? They didn't need to happen in the way that it's been written, like the entire village went. I think people came and went all the time. Yeah, I see. Yeah, but there was permanent um, people on the coast, the permanent people inland. Yeah, and I think travel was often. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that much warmer in Rockland in the winter anyway than Norwich Walk, really. Mm -hmm. So why? I don't know why you would do that. Yeah. I think um, let's let's say you you know there's moose on the coast, right? Would there have been caribou on the coast? Probably. All right. So if everything you need is where you're at, there's not a whole lot. To, but if you're inland and you, like I say, if you're hungry for clams, you know, you gotta, you gotta do a little travel to get them. So I think, you know, like today, you know, we modern living, we can live anywhere. But in those times, you had to be near water, and and that water was rivers. So those rivers are just highways right to the ocean. And there's you know, nowhere in Maine that it wouldn't take you just, it would just be a couple of days to get wherever you wanted to go. We have stories about runners uh, delivering messages from Boston to New Brunswick in two days. A relay system. 
they had ropes with knots and they all, they all had meanings and they would run from one village to another and the next runner would take off. And we also had, you know, the canoe, tri the canoe routes all through Maine, portages, you know, the beaver were maintained so that we could get up these small streams and, and, uh, and not really have to go out into the ocean all that much. So you think David Cook's book's fairly accurate in terms of the routes? I think so, yeah, yeah. I didn't, I, I, at the time I read it, I, didn't, I don't remember finding anything that I thought, what? It all made sense to me, yeah. Absolutely. Which is that book? David Cook's? No. Above the Gravel Above the Gravel Bar? Above the oh, Gravel Bar. Yeah. Yeah. I read it a long time ago. Yeah. So speaking of rivers, what's the latest political situation with the Penobscot and the tribe? And well, I think there are still legal processes to be uh, ventured uh, federally. Because uh, uh, there's no way we would st the tribe would stand for the attorney general's decision that the river was not ours. Now, when I say ours, that's using a modern day concept that we have to. It's a constraint that we have to work within. Traditionally speaking, we wouldn't say we own the river. Uh, but if we're living on the river and you come to our river, you're going to kind of follow our protocols in terms of how to live there. But in today's times. You know, we, we view ownership through the authority. Who has the authority over the Penobscot River? Well, who the hell's been there for 12,000 years and never relinquished it? You know, so that's my view. That's that old Indian view. Uh, you know, my grandmother was bad. She was, she was wild. And that's where I get it. So, what I told the people running for governor, and they were all on the reservation, is that it, in my mind, traditionally thinking, the tribes have inherent sovereignty. This is something no law can take away from a race of people who've been here for 12,000 years. Inherent. Okay, from there we get into more modern times with colonization and this, this, this concept of, well, you know, we won the war, you lost, so it's too bad. You know, there really wasn't this major war that would have done that. There was this treaty signing from time, and then the next time a treaty was signed, and the next time a treaty was signed, and those treaties weren't honored. You know, people kept encroaching upon uh, our territories until finally we're, 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 we're kind of like in the Penobscot River, and that's it. <laughs> Just the islands in the Penobscot River and the main stem, the, the word in this last treaty was main stem of the Penobscot River. Well, what does that tell you? The Attorney General decided it meant that pond in the middle of Indian Island and not the river. That makes no sense to us. You grow up generation after generation knowing that that river is your homeland. Who is the state of Maine or anyone else to tell us it's not? The state of Maine is wrong. Janet Mills was wrong, deciding that that river belonged to the state of Maine. So that was her decision. Um, you know, and I didn't follow it close enough, but we're in, we're in court still. I know there are legal issues, um, pending. Is that the right word, pending? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still pending. So um, we have to have the federal government side with us on this. They have to overrule it if it's possible. Um, in that, see, we have the Penobscot Nation is known as what is called a federally recognized tribe. In other words, we're a real tribe because the federal government says so. <laughs> Boy, didn't my grandmother love that one? Who the hell did they tell us we're Indian? Right? So, anyway, you have to apply for it, you go through a process, and it's a legal process. And you have to prove that you, in fact, have your land, you have your language, you have your, your government, and, and your life. So, that and we became a federally recognized tribe. With that comes this really odd ball of conditions and uh, so that we kind of let the government like own our land so they hold it in trust for us is what it's called. You know and the common sense from my way of thinking is why do they have to hold it in trust? Why can't we hold it in trust? We've been here 12,000 years. We've been on this continent for how long? You know, so however long human beings have been walking. So does the state own it and trust, or does the federal government own it and trust? 
when the, when the federal government owns native territory in trust, it's on behalf of the native tribe. So we have land here in Maine held by the federal government in trust for our, our purposes. We have the authority on those lands, so our laws apply. So if we want to hunt at night, we can hunt at night, you know, things like that. When the state declared they own the river, they own it in trust for people of the state of Maine, not the native people. Now, on that river, we can no longer have the right to do our culture as we decide. We would have to fit within the rules and regulations of the state of Maine. Most of those rules and regulations make sense, so that's not the problem. The problem is you're telling us we have to be like Mainers when we're not, we're native people. Hmm. So I wish I could give you that exact legal answer, but I, but I know it's still pending. It's not over. Um, well, that reminds me of uh, a conversation about sovereignty that uh, we were having at the Norwalk Grange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What and I, I was trying to understand exactly what that would mean, what that looks like, and it ties into things about like river rights and usage rights, not so much about property ownership as it is about being able to fish, some, that type of, to use the land how you want, not so much to say that you own it. If you, let's say if you didn't want to use the word ownership, but if you had authority over it, that's ownership. Yeah. So it would be legally. So if we, this federal definition, although at the time it sounded stupid and why did we need it, the fact remains the reality of life to it today is that federal recognition is the best thing we have. So if the state were simply just to say, okay, like every state in the nation except Maine has done and said, we accept, we recognize federal sovereignty status of that tribe within our state. Every state but Maine. What's that's, wrong with Maine? That's the point that I was trying to remember. Yeah. So what would that give us? Federal sovereign, uh, uh, we, federal recognition, state recognition as though it was federal. Um, we would have the same rights as all of the tribes have. Some of them you may not like, but this ain't about you. <laughs> you know, I, I, I you know, the, the whole like concept what? of gaming. Like what? Gaming. Oh, yeah, gaming. Okay, every tribe yeah. federally recognized has a right to, for gaming. Yeah. Now, in there is a process. They have to work it out with the state. So it's not like we're just running over the state. Um, but that, what about it, control over the, the pollution? That yes, that's, that's another one. We would have a seat at the table every time somebody is wanting to pollute in Penobscot water. We had that. Angus King applied for absolute control of all bodies of water in the state of Maine. And Bill Clinton said, you can have it except Indian waters. Because these are federally recognized tribes and we're here to take care of them. And he didn't like that. And neither did John Baldacci. So when Baldacci got in, he applied through Bush. And Bush says, what Indians? <laughs> yeah, you can have it. So we lost that. We had a seat at the table and we had legal input on how much pollution could go into the water. Now we don't. Now we can go to a hearing and say, I disagree. And they say, yeah, okay. Um, I mean, I'm thinking I remember hearing something about 200 years ago when Maine separated from Massachusetts that there was written into that agreement something about Native American sovereignty and Native Americans having control over their lands. And that that just kind of got pushed aside or ignored in further um, mm -hmm. agreements and treaties and stuff like that. Was there something originally in that document 200 years ago when those two states separated that Massachusetts was trying to guarantee basically sovereignty of, their, of the Native people? Uh, my there, understanding of Massachusetts. I'm not getting that right. I can't, I can't guess for, I, I can't imagine for a minute Massachusetts saying that the, the tribes are sovereign. Yeah. Um, even if they did, it, I can't see where it amounted to anything. Yeah. Because they had total ownership of our territories. 
after we helped them win the revolution. Right. You know, do, do you recognize the King of England? We said, you have a King of England? Okay. <laughs> and they said, oh, so you recognize him, which means you're a subject thereof. Right. So, you know, all that's, but when Maine became Maine, they took the view that, well, we have people in Maine, and some of them are like Indian, but if we don't talk about them, maybe they'll go away. Yeah. So we became a, a uh, kind of like a race of nothing. Okay, so the state then, it's called the Indian problem. What do we do with Indians? They don't want to be us, but you know, we're stuck with them, and they're kind of in the way, you know? Yeah. So they took the remaining parts of our land Katahdin and, and that whole region. This is what really blows me up about the National Park. That's traditional Penobscot territory. It never was relinquished. Right. So, right. and they went from writing the title to themselves down to this office and put a pot of money in to buy it. Right. Never having discussed it with the tribe. Then they tell the tribe, if you need money, let us know. So they set up an office on the reservation with what was called the Indian agent. And if you were hungry and you wanted money to go buy food, he would write you out a little check and you'd go buy some food or clothing. It was food and clothing. So we, you know, my grandmother's like, I'm not taking that money. The, you know, I don't, I'm not poor. I can work for my money. She didn't know that was money that took our lands away up, up north. So this is this has been the relationship we've had. Yeah. Are you talking about Baxter? Was Baxter? It, it was four townships in that area. Including if it didn't include Katahdin, which I don't, I can't really say for sure. Then how did Katahdin? How did we ever lose conveyance of that? That doesn't make any sense either. We would never say to the state, "Yeah, go ahead and take it." It's it's our spiritual altar. About go ahead and take it. No, that makes make sense to me. And why are the towns of Millinocca and Medway, East Medway, only 100 years old? Mm. Mm. Isn't that kind of weird? <laughs> yeah. This is why I bring Laura. <laughs> <laughs>